Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits and I have an in-depth look at my latest finished project, my 1940s vintage sweater. So let's get started. This tidbit comes to me from Louise, who messaged me on Ravelry. A couple of weeks ago, Louise had shared a radio interview with an Australian shepherd who had suffered a back injury when he was young, which then led him to becoming a wool grader rather than working as a shepherd. And this tidbit today is a follow-up to that interview where the process of scouring raw fleece is explained. I'll leave a link down uh, in the show notes to this follow-up tidbit. This tidbit came to me in my Twitter feed. It's a painting showing a woman knitting. I love pieces of art like this that show knitters at work. So there's a, a Wikipedia page about this painting, which says that it's called The Sock Knitter and that The Sock Knitter is a 1915 painting by the Australian artist Grace Cossington Smith. The painting depicts a woman believed to be the artist's sister knitting a sock. It was the first work by Cossington Smith to be exhibited and has been, quote, acclaimed as the first post-impressionist painting to be exhibited in Australia. The work was included in the Follow the Flag exhibition held at the National Gallery of Victoria in 2015. The exhibition material stated that the sock knitter, quote, has become to symbolize Australian women's contribution to the First World War effort, which included knitting more than 1.3 million pairs of socks. Here's the thing, though. I don't think she's knitting a sock. She's clearly using two needles to knit whatever it is she's knitting. You can see the knobs at the end of the needle. And I won't argue that it isn't possible to knit socks with two needles because it absolutely is, I've done it. But I don't think that socks knit for soldiers in World War I would have been considered acceptable if they were knit on two needles. Socks knit on two needles require seams. So let me explain why I don't think she was knitting socks and why socks knit on two needles, why I think those wouldn't have been acceptable. World War I was a war fought in waterlogged trenches and the soldiers were at risk of suffering from trench foot. They needed to be able to change their socks every 12 hours or so to keep their feet dry and any sort of discomfort in the sock, any ridge, any bump could have caused an irritation that could then lead to an infection, which could then lead to trench foot. There is a big shift in sock knitting that occurred during World War I because there was this continued need for socks. And that shift was grafting shut sock toes rather than using a three needle bind up, which was extremely common prior to that. Grafting was used mostly for repairs before World War I rather than for grafting sock toes. But there were, there were knitting books. I found several knitting books from the late 19th century and the early 20th century that listed grafting as an option for finishing a, soft to, a sock toe. It just wasn't very common. And then there's often this suggestion that the British commander, Lord Kitchener, was responsible for this change toward grafted sock toes. But there's there's no evidence that this is actually true. I did a segment about this uh, in a casual Friday episode a couple of years ago about this lack of evidence, and I'll link to that uh, down below in case you're interested. Socks weren't the only uh, knitted comforts for soldiers. There was a need for what they called cholera belts, <laughs> which was like a, a knitted band of fabric that would go around the abdomen. There were helmets, there were scarves, there were sweaters. Lots of different things were knit for soldiers during World War I, and many of those items would have been knitted on two needles. And, you know, I'm guessing that the artist, Cosington Smith, 
painted the picture before it was given a title. So it could be that the title, The Sock Knitter, communicated more about what the knitter's purpose was, which was knitting for the war effort, rather than a title that described what she was actually knitting might have, have done. Like calling it the cholera belt knitter or the helmet knitter isn't going to hit home quite in the same way as the sock knitter and what that communicates to the person viewing the painting. Regardless, <laughs> it's a wonderful painting. I love seeing uh, knitting portrayed in art. I just wish we could find the answer as to what it was that she really was knitting and what the story was um, behind choosing that particular title. This tidbit came to me from my husband. So there's been this trend in the past few years of extending the life of clothing through a process called visible mending. Visible mending creates this sort of decorative addition to the clothing. Um, it, it draws attention to the area where the repair was made rather than deflecting attention away from it. What my husband shared with me though was a link to a video um, and I'll put it down in the show notes. It's a documentary about a father and daughter team in Japan who practice kakatsugi, I think is how it's pronounced, kakatsugi. I'll put it on the screen, which is a technique for repairing holes or tears invisibly. Rather than drawing the eye toward that repaired area, the repair just erases the damage altogether. And it, it is the most incredible thing i i just i can't i can't overstate how amazing their process is so the father had trained to be a tailor when he was young his father owned a tailoring shop and he his plan was to learn tailoring and take over the shop but shortly after he began managing his father's store the clothing industry changed and you started getting more fast fashion so custom tailored clothing was not something that was going to feed his family. What he decided to do was teach himself how to repair clothing. And he studied all sorts of weaves. He would study for hours. He has all of these notebooks full of, of studying different ways that, that fabric is woven together so that he could learn how to do this sort of invisible mending. He assumed that none of his three daughters was going to be interested in taking over this business. But when his youngest daughter was like in middle school, she borrowed a pair of pants or trousers, whatever you want to call them, from a friend of hers and then went bike riding and then the pants got ripped and she didn't know what she was going to do. She got up the next morning and her father had repaired them overnight completely invisibly. And so she realized sort of what, how magical <laughs> that skill was and she wanted to learn it. She had to kind of learn based on all her, you know, from her father and all of his research that he had done over the years, she had to learn that the, the way to repair all of these woven fabrics. But then so many fabrics these days are knitted and he didn't really have any experience with that. So she has been able to figure out how to fix knitted items as well. And she's younger and so she's done things like given them an online presence um, using technology. So now their customers aren't just from their local area, they're from a wider range. So the, the clothing that people bring to them is typically something very special and, and meaningful to them. The repairs are so good that they have to put a little sticker on it when they return it to the customer so that the customer can identify where the repair was made. These pieces of clothing are typically so meaningful to the people that they're just overcome with joy at, at having them restored back to their original condition. So really, I cannot recommend this documentary enough. It is It is so amazing. I just wish I could watch them work for hours and hours. If you have any tidbits you'd like to share with me, you can send me a direct message on Ravelry or you can create a post in my Ravelry group to tell me about it or you could send me an email or you can tag me on Instagram. You can find links to all those methods down in the show notes. I finished my 1940s vintage sweater, so let me model it for you. I'll stand up and, and model it for you, give you a little twirl. <laughs>
The pattern is called Harlequin. It was published in the April 1949 issue of Stitchcraft, uh, which was a monthly publication in the UK. The Knitting and Crochet Guild of the UK has a really large archive of knitting books and patterns, including many issues of Stitchcraft. And so as a member of the guild, I was able to request a copy of this pattern for personal use. The yarn I used is Brown Sheep Nature Spun. So Nature Spun comes in, I think it's four different weights. There's Fingering, Sport, Worsted, and then Chunky. Now, Brown Sheep is an American company and it's a, it's a vertical mill, which means they process the wool at every stage. They do the scouring, they do the dyeing, the carding, and the spinning. The way that they spin this wool is different from the way most commercially milled plied yarns are spun. This is the fingering weight version of Nature Spud. And normally when I make myself a fingering weight sweater, I will wear a camisole underneath it because even if it's like superwash or merino or both, I tend to just find sweaters a little itchy. My skin's a little bit sensitive at different places. I was surprised when I tried the sweater on how comfortable the wool actually was because I did try it on over a camisole and I thought like, the camisole just made it a little too bulky because it's a very close fitting sweater. And so I tried it on without the camisole and it was just so comfortable. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not comparing it to like a cotton t-shirt. I can, you know, feel the fiber, but it's not irritating or prickly to me. I also really like Nature Spun because it's, it's a really versatile yarn. It does bloom when it is washed and blocked the way a woolen spun yarn would bloom. And that makes it really nice for color work. Now I've got intarsia here, but for stranded color work, if you like that effect, uh, that kind of painterly effect where the, the colors, the stitches kind of blend together, this, kind, this yarn would be really good for that. But there's also really plenty of stitch definition, which you would typically want for textured patterns and cables and what you would get with a smooth worsted spun yarn. So this yarn really seems to ride that line between a worsted spun and woolen spun. I'm not talking worsted weight, I'm talking worsted spun versus woolen spun. When you look at the kind of yardage you get, it's more similar to what you'd see with a woolen spun yarn as well. There's just so many yards of wool in one unit, whether it's a 50 gram ball or a 100 gram ball. So it really makes me think that they're doing something pretty special at their mill. So a little background on why I chose this sweater pattern. This sweater is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. And so far I've completed a sweater from every decade up through the 1960s. I just finished my 1960s sweater a few weeks back. This sweater is the only project within my long-term project that I knit in collaboration with another knitter. Billy from Show and Tell Knitting uh, saw last fall that I hadn't yet done a 1940s sweater. That's an era that she really enjoys uh, knitting from and she frequently does knit alongs on her channel really with vintage patterns from that era. So she suggested that we select a pattern together and then each knit it and see where we end up. Given that we are two different knitters with different experiences and different preferences and different goals. So we had conversations along the way at key points in the process, like when we selected, the, how we selected the pattern, how we chose our colors, how we decided what uh, techniques we were going to use in order to knit it. And each of us has published those conversations or part of those conversations on our respective channels as we've gone along. On her channel, she usually uploads most of the entire conversation while I usually use a much smaller segment uh, just because of the way our channels are structured differently. Billy and I have very different goals when it comes to selecting our vintage knitting projects. So she's interested in adding a new garment to her wardrobe and I'm interested in selecting a pattern that serves my long-term project. So the goal of that long-term project is to understand the evolution of the hand knit sweater during the time frame of sweater patterns published in print. 
and in print only. So traditional garments knit earlier in the 19th century in which we're taught, you know, one-on-one -on -one knitter to knitter are not included in this project, nor are sweater patterns published in the era of digital downloads, which would have been post 2000. And I'm looking at five areas of evolution. I'm looking at the purpose of the sweater in in that particular decade, the materials and tools called for, the construction methods used, and the specific techniques used to accomplish that construction, and then finally, how the pattern is actually presented to the knitter. So all of these things evolved over the course of the hundred and some year time period. So when I go to select a pattern from a partic particular decade, I'm looking for something that's emblematic of that decade, I'm looking at something I think will be interesting to knit and then offers me an opportunity to learn something new. I am looking for something that I hope I will want to wear, but I will always choose something to learn over something that I will want to wear. As I've mentioned many times, my main personality trait is that I'm an information seeker. I love to learn. And so if I'm not learning something as I'm knitting, it isn't because there isn't something to learn <laughs> because there is always something to learn. One of the characteristics of sweater patterns published prior to about 1950 is that they were presented in one size. So I have made modifications to some of the patterns in order to end up with something that would actually fit me because I want to try on the sweater when it's finished in order to understand what it would feel like uh, to wear that garment. Uh, so this is the first pattern where I made a design modification, um, which was the neckline. Originally it was a straight across boat neck and I created this little scoop. And I really agonized about whether or not to make that change. But in the end, I decided it would, I would still learn something new, but it, then I would also end up with something I was more likely to want to wear. So back in the 1890s, sweaters were athletic garments or practical garments for outdoor activities for the most part. And they were typically knit in worsted weight wool and they were meant to keep the person warm. Like it was a very practical garment. In the 1920s, there was this transition to sportswear that did not actually mean something that you would wear while playing sports. Um, so knitwear became an element of actual fashion. And that's when you start to see a trend in the yarn weight changing into being finer and you start seeing closer fitting blouses that are knit at fine gauges. So the purpose of this sweater is clearly fashion based and not, it's not an athletic garment. <laughs> The materials and tools called for in this pattern, the, the original yarn that was called for was called Peyton's Beehive Three Ply Wool, which was Peytonized. Um, meaning that it was treated to be shrink resistant. I looked up in the Ravelry database to see if that yarn was mentioned. There is a Peyton's and Baldwin Beehive Three Ply Scotch Fingering that was produced around the early 1950s. I'm not sure how, how much earlier than that it was produced. And I'm not sure if there would have been a difference between a yarn that was labeled as three ply fingering versus three ply scotch fingering. I don't know if those were two different products that they produced. The gauge it was called for was seven and a half stitches and 10 rows per inch. On size 12, and size 10 beehive needles. Now those are UK needle sizes, the old UK needle sizes before they went metric. Uh, UK needles go in the opposite direction as the US needles. A size seven is the same in both of them. And then in a UK needle, the bigger the size, the smaller the needle. So a UK size 12 is what a US two would be, which is a 2.75 millimeter. And the UK size 10 is a US three, which is a 3.25 millimeter. So I swatched, I obviously wasn't gonna be able to use the yarn uh, that they used. Um, so I got something that was fingering weight and I swatched on what I thought was a US size three needle. 
and I got the exact gauge, but it, it turned out those needles were ones I had bought early on in my knitting life when I was either living in Ireland or New Zealand. They were actually a three millimeter, not a US three, which is fine. It's the gauge that's important, but a, a three millimeter is a size US two and a half, basically. I use a US zero, which is a two millimeter. Uh, as my smaller needle that was used for the hems of the sleeve and the body. As was typical of the era, this sweater was constructed bottom up, flat in pieces, and then seamed. And as I mentioned, the color work is intarsia. That is a technique that needs to be done back and forth. If you're not familiar with intarsia, I'll leave a link above and down in the show notes to my intro to intarsia video so you can understand uh, how it was worked. Originally the sweater, the front and the back were knit identically. And after you were finished with the shoulder shaping and you'd have just the neck stitches left, you would work the neck for an additional one inch before binding off. And then the neck would be folded under and sewn down. So I'll turn around and see if you can see on the back. So the, the, that's how it was supposed to be done for both. This folded hem would match the hems that you had at the base of the cuffs as well as the bodies. The way the shoulder shaping was supposed to be done was with stair step bind off. So you bind off a third of the, of the stitches, finish knitting, come back, bind off the next third, finish knitting that row, knit back, and then bind off the last. So you end up with this little stair step look. Then the right shoulder is seamed together and half of the left shoulder is seamed together and then you leave the remainder of it open. So the idea is that that gives you a large enough neck opening that you can pull it over your head because that straight across neck was six and a half inches on the front and the back that's a 13 inch neck. That's not big enough to pull over your head. So the opening was uh, to give you an extra couple of inches so that you could comfortably pull it over your head. So in that era, not only would you have done a stair step bind off, you would have joined the shoulders using a technique called back stitch. That's how you would have seamed it together. You wouldn't have used mattress stitch, which would probably be what you would use today. Once the seaming was completed on the shoulders, the instructions called for on that long that opening for a row of double crochet along each of those open edges, which in the US, that's single crochet. The instructions then say to fasten with press studs, which are snaps. And I talked a bit last week about interpreting instructions from a pattern that comes from a different country where terminology might be different. And I briefly wondered what type of snap a press stud might be. I did assume that it was a standard sewn in clothing snap, but I could visualize issues with sewing in a snap uh, into stretchy knitted fabric and the potential for that edge to get stretched out. And I also thought there would be an aesthetic issue in overlapping the two edges in order to fasten the snaps because of how those two edges were finished off basically even with each other. So one of the things that I explore in these vintage patterns is how techniques are used. And so sometimes I'm very familiar with the technique that they're calling for and what it's going to turn out. And I will feel comfortable substituting a technique that I think gives a better result. But if there's ever a technique that I have never seen before, or I've never tried before, I always try it out in a, usually I swatch it out to see how it's going to work. The way that those snaps were going to work was something that I wanted to swatch out and I wanted to swatch it out in the context of how those shoulders would have been shaped if I had done the stair step shaping and then consider what my options were for the snaps and then think about what did I want to do with the shoulders based on the fact that I didn't do stair step shaping. I did short row shaping and I was using a three needle bind off, which is a much flatter, smoother finished edge uh, with less bulk 
So what, what would I want uh, to do differently than uh, what the pattern stated? One of the things that I'm constantly saying, there's always multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint. And one of the things that I like to do is think about what are all the different ways, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of each of those choices in a given specific situation? Because what is the best solution in one situation is not necessarily going to be the best solution in another situation. So what I wanna do right now is go to the overhead. I wanna show you how that shoulder would have been constructed if I had followed the directions and then what would have happened with the it was a couple of different option, options for the snaps. And then I will show you what I actually did in my sweater. This is the original construction method. There is this stair step bind off here. There would be, there were three, three bind offs. There's uh, nine stitches and then another nine and then another nine. Then the two edges had to be sewn together halfway across. And then across each of these edges, you had to do a row of single crochet actually from, uh, you had to do a row of single crochet. And part of what that did was it kind of evened out the little stair step that would have been right here. Then you're left with these, you know, two edges and it says to fasten with the press studs. It doesn't say which surfaces to put the snaps on. And, and many of you who answered said, well, they should be overlapped. So if I had done one set of snaps back here and one here and I had overlapped them, I don't particularly, I mean, of course you wouldn't see this, these two snaps right there. I, I don't particularly like the way that looks. I had thought it, it was possible. These are very tiny snaps I'm using here. Uh, they're like six millimeter or a quarter of an inch. So my thought was because this type of seam is so bulky, you could do them together and then the seam could lie on your shoulder like this. I mean, you could see the snap um, from above, but it, it would give something that would be more in line with continuing the seam line. So those are the two options that I was thinking of as being possible. Barbara Smith, who is the archivist at the Knitting and Crochet Guild of the UK, the, the archivist who sent me the copy of this pattern originally, sent me an email saying she had seen a number of patterns with snap closures. It was very common in the 1940s to have some sort of a, a closure either at the shoulder or the back of the neck because of the very close fitting necklines uh, of that era. And she remembered that a brand called Lee Target had really good detailed finishing instructions in their patterns. And so she sent me a pattern that had instructions for a snap closure. It wasn't instructions like what, the, what this pattern called for, but they were really interesting in instructions. And I, soon as I read them, I knew that the result would be better than either the options I could see using um, with that single crochet edge that uh, the Harlequin pattern called for. So I did not do stair step shaping. I did short row shaping. Uh, and then I did a three needle bind off to join here. The technique that Barbara sent me from the Knit and Crochet Guild was to create a tiny seam. They, talk, they talked about folding over the edge to create a tiny seam. So I just did the best I could just basically you know, trapping the bind off edge so that it would roll over in kind of a whip stitch fashion. And then on this edge, the back edge of the shoulder, you were to pick up stitches along here, knit four rows of stockinette, and then a couple of rows of garter stitch and then bind off. And so I could use larger snaps here because I had more room. Um, and then I could um, snap those um, across there. And this edge then keeps in line with the seam edge. And again, because it's lying above the surface, you, you, you do see the, you know, the snaps from behind. This is my preference. I like this better than I like this. Some people were worried about there being a big ridge and being uncomfortable. There's already a big ridge from the seam. These are very tiny snaps. It wouldn't have been uncomfortable. It's just a question of, of which sort of result would have been best. And I, and if I had to choose, if I had to use this 
construction with the stair steps and the back stitch, I think I would have preferred um, snaps like this personally, but that's why you have options. You get to choose whatever it is that's going to work best for you and your project, and I ended up choosing this technique here. I also turned my neckline under. I went and I did pick up the stitches and I knit up and I didn't do it in ribbon. I did it in stockinette. And then I wanted this to have a little bit of a nicer edge. So I think I did yarn overs, like knit one yarn over, knit one yarn over, just so it has a little bit of a mm -hmm. saggy edge. And then I continued knitting and I folded it in and I tacked it down. And I did the same thing on the cuffs. Mm -hmm. I left a little slit here. I thought just to have a little uh, detail. And I did the same thing at the bottom, which I'm off screen, but there's my hem. So no ribbing. Right. Like just a hemmed edge. I thought that I thought that makes it a little bit less sporty, a little bit more elegant. Uh -huh. Since that handbag. Yeah, that's a fancy handbag. So does yours pull over? Or do you have some kind of a closure at the completely pull over and there's plenty of room? I started from the top down, mm -hmm. even though the pattern didn't call for that. Obviously, vintage patterns. I've right. never seen a vintage pattern that started from the neck and went down. They all start at the bottom and go up. But I felt like this whole area was key to this sweater. So I started here and worked down and then I picked up stitches across the shoulder and worked back the other way. And I only went down a little bit. I went down actually one triangle's worth in the back because there's an extra triangle on the back compared to the front to allow right. for that difference from, you know, back mm -hmm. to front. I made sure that I could get it over my head before I proceeded to knit the rest of the sweater. Did the original pattern call for any kind of closure at the shoulders or was it a completely a pullover, a pullover? It was pullover. And the only reason I couldn't go by theirs was it was a different size than mine. Right. So, and then did they have the same kind of neck hem or was it a ribbing? I don't remember. I don't remember. I think the waistline was ribbing, but I opted to go with right. more of the hem from your Harlequin. When I was redesigning this neck, the original one was pretty close fitting. And so I kept the circumference of the original neck. So this would also be close fitting, which, and also I hadn't done a snap closure and I wanted to do that because that's part of my goal is to try these different constructions and see how it works and see what I think about it and just get that experience. So yeah, because a couple of people had asked me, well, when you're redesigning the neck, since it's deeper, it seems like there should be more room and you should be able to pull it over. Well, the, I made the neck narrower because that would have been, you know, you wouldn't have had a six and a half inch wide neck at that time. They were more like four to four and a half. But when you don't have ribbing, the, the, all of the fabric comes right up to your neck, then the hole is, you know, 13, 14 inches in circumference. And my head's 22. And but, there's no stretch like you would right. have. And there's you know some stretch to it, but not that much. But if you if you have a large if you if this if you have an inch of ribbing all the way around, then the actual opening is probably is six inches larger in circumference if you have an one inch uh, ribbing around. So so if you have ribbing, then it's you know big enough to go over your head. But I was starting to look because somebody mentioned in the Ravelry group that. Uh, so a blog post that about these kind of snap closures and then I started I went back and I looked at a lot of the other pullovers and sometimes they even have like a little zipper in the back they'll have a zipper or they'll have snaps or buttons and the, or uh, snaps or, or buttons on here and that was really common and I thought I wonder why I didn't notice that and I thought well maybe it's because I usually gravitate toward cardigans and so I, the first book I, I pulled out to look at, there was nothing but cardigans in it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so once I started finding, cause some of the other options we were looking at did have either like a zip or a, or a, some kind of closure in the back. 
a little um, loop and a button and like a tear like a little you know something to give an extra mm-hmm. you know few mm-hmm. inches of headroom which i just hadn't hadn't noticed don't baby sweaters often snap on yeah, the because their heads are giant compared to the rest of their bodies. So that was the only time I'd ever seen a closure like that was like for buttons for babies. I hadn't seen it in an adult sweater before. Maybe stand up and turn around so everybody can see what, what the- Okay. <laughs> you see my derriere, huh? Oh, it looks nice. It looks very 40s with those shoulders. So let's look at how the pattern is presented to the knitter. There are two photos of the sweater that were in the issue of Stitchcraft. One was in black and white and the other was in color. And this pattern is very typical of the era. It's presented in one to fit size, 33 to 35 inch bust. It doesn't give you the actual finished measurements, just to fit size. The yarn requirements are listed in ounces, not in yards. And there's no schematic. The stitch and row gauge are given, which was something that was typical of the 40s and also the 30s. But row gauge prior to that was very uncommonly given. So that's one of the really nice things about a 1940s pattern is that they give you the stitch and row gauge. Uh, they also gave uh, two length measurements. They gave the total length from the shoulder to the bottom of the hem. And they also gave the measurement of the sleeve seam from the underarm to the bottom of the hem. They did not give any circumferences. None of those were stated, just the to fit a 33 to 35 inch bust and that was it. The written instructions are presented with the printing space available as the primary consideration. Like they are actually having to physically print this and they're trying to cram as much information as they can into a smaller amount of space. They're not as concerned with readability. There isn't a line break for every new row instruction, for example. I do have stitch counts. I have stitch and row gauge and I could draw my own schematic and then I could see what the actual circumference of the sweater was, when it changed size and what that size was at key places. There are actually three different circumferences to this sweater. There's the starting circumference at the high hip, there's the waist circumference, and then there's the full bust circumference. Because of how the row instructions are chained together, I didn't realize until I, until I started drawing the schematic that the waist shaping had increases and decreases positioned at the side seams as well as below the bust points. So this is a construction technique I had heard of previously, but it wasn't one I'd ever used in a pattern. And so that was one of the reasons that this particular sweater pattern was really appealing for me to try. It had a number of things for me to learn. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.